Welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started in our first panel um, after lunch um, of the post-industrial city symposium. I'm delighted to welcome you all back here and to be introducing the second or really the third keynote speaker of the day, Mame Jackson. Um, Mame Jackson is a distinguished professor emerita of art history and a professor of community engagement in the Irvin Reed Honors College. She is, has an extremely distinguished career. Um, she was uh, chair of Department of Art and Art History when she came to Wayne in 1995. And her primary research interests are Native North American art and arts of the African diaspora. She has undertaken extensive field work in the Canadian Arctic and in Northeast Brazil, and has curated a number of exhibitions, and I understand is working on curating some others right in the neighborhood um, at the Charles H. Wright African American Museum. Um, she has been supported by the most distinguished of fellowships, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Secretariat for Culture and Tourism of Bahia, Brazil, and other agencies, and also held a Fulbright in Bahia, Brazil in 2000-2001. Now through the Honors College, she currently directs Art Corps Detroit, um, and I'm going to circulate um, flyers that she's brought that tell us about the Art Corps project, and teaches service learning courses on art and community engagement. So she's also extremely involved in the community right here around Wayne State. And I believe that that is going to be the subject of her talk today, which is titled Art, a Catalyst for Creative Community in Detroit. So please join me in welcoming Amy Jackson. Thanks, thanks very much, and thank you, Elena. You know what I'm realizing I don't have is the clicker for that. Um, Well, thank, thanks everybody. Thanks for, for being here this afternoon. And Walter, where are you? I want to. Um, oh, there you are. I, you know, it's it's very customary when people start a talk to say, "Oh, thanks." You know, thanks for inviting me. And I want to say that very sincerely. This is not a rhetorical courtesy, Walter. I want to thank you for what you and the Humanities Center do to bring about dialogues uh, of this sort. Um, to call on your friends and others and invite them to think seriously about a topic and come together and share those thoughts. Um, it brings a great energy and uh, uh, a dialogue in this university that is really fundamental. So you know, thanks, thanks for inviting me, but thanks for what you do uh, on and on uh, through the Humanities Center. The topic uh, of today's uh, symposium, <coughs> the post-industrial uh, city, uh, is really uh, timely for Detroit. Detroit is the poster child for post-industrial cities. And we've attracted here people from all around the world who are interested in the idea, the experience, the notion of a post-industrial city. About a year ago, Time Magazine bought a house in Detroit, stationed uh, part of their staff here to look over a period of a year at what was going on in Detroit. Uh, so that Detroit is very much a part of the national and international news media, and it's a city that whoops, oh yeah, uh, that attracts uh, journalists, uh, urban planners, artists, and others. Um, it's a city that is the extreme, in some ways, of a post-industrial city, uh, a city that has experienced an economic disaster. There are very few cities that have had quite the singularity of industry that Detroit has had. So the bankruptcy of the automobile industry uh, was a particularly tough blow in Detroit. Um, unemployment here is, oh, well, you see different estimates. I'm picking something kind of in the middle because you see it on both sides. And I think probably that seeing it on both sides is a reflection that in some areas of the city it's X and in some other areas of the city it's Y. Uh, and I've seen it as high as 50%. Uh, uh, I've seen it as low as 20%. But in either case, it's considerably higher than the national average. The population loss in Detroit isn't the only city to have experienced a population loss, but it is dramatic to lose more than half your population over a period of just a few decades, from the late 50s to now, to go from 
1.8 million to about three quarters of a million people. No wonder we have so much of uh, empty land in the city of Detroit. And no wonder we have so much physical deterioration with the uh, uh, industry leaving, uh, with people themselves leaving. Uh, a third of the city is empty, and you know that as you drive around. Public schools in Detroit rank among the lowest in the, in the country. And uh, discouragingly, this country ranks fairly low among industrial nations in the world. So, you know, we, we have problems on our hand. And crime, which I'll come back to, is a, a, a steady force in our city. But let's just talk for a minute about the, post, the, nation, the notion of a post-industrial city. We have one of the icons of post-industrial cities, the uh, Michigan Central Station. This actually is a photograph which is also the cover of a book called The Ruins of Detroit. It came out about a year ago uh, by two French uh, photographers who have uh, photographed the ruins of many great cities in the world. And this is among them and one of the most recent uh, of their publications. Uh, Detroit attracts artists, artists who come here to look at the ruins of the city. Uh, you probably remember about a year ago when Detroit disassembled came out to kind of great um, uproar in the city because it really reflects the destruction, the kind of the decay and the dystopia of a, of a post-industrial city. This, the, the uh, book, which is pictured in the upper left corner, uh, that's the cover of the book, accompanied an exhibition at the Akron Museum of Art, you might remember, uh, an exhibition of photographs by Andrew Moore uh, who photographed, for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, industrial settings, abandoned industrial settings, like this uh, uh, rolling hall from the Rouge complex. Another is the Packard Company. I mean, you look at a photograph like this, you can hardly imagine the scale of this. I mean, it does practically blow your imagination. Even if you live here, it blows your imagination. That kind of reminds me, as an aside, I used to have, when I was chair of the Department of Art and Art History, I had the role often of taking candidates around town to acquaint them with the city and tell them how great Detroit was and you know, try to attract them to Wayne State. And, and I, I, I'm still very high in the city, and I've always been very high in the city. So I didn't have a candidate in the passenger seat of my car, and we'd be driving someplace, and I'd say, oh, you know, this, this grocery store just opened, or there's a new coffee shop. And I'd hear this gasp in the seat next to me, and I, the voice would say, <gasps> but look behind it. <laughs> and, and so there are different ways of looking at the city. And I think for some of the people who have been attracted as artists or others to come in, it's, it's this dystopia. It's this abandonment. It's the, it's the awesome di kind of disruption and, and decay of the city that was once one of the most important industrial cities in the world, fourth largest city in the United States, the arsenal of democracy during the Second World War. And, and this is what it's come to. Um, this, ironically, another photograph by Andrew Moore is the Detroit Public School Book Depository. Now link that to what I just said about the, the ranking of the uh, <coughs> Detroit Public Schools and the, uh, the, the, the loss, the destruction, the decay that's, that's represented in this photograph. Now, not all photographs concentrate on that, uh, that uh, side of the picture of Detroit, and there are many, many, as, as many of us as there are in the room, that's how many different perspectives we have here in the room, and we all have our own perspective. Uh, Andrew Morris tended to be of the sort that I'm showing you. His work, by the way, is represented in a, an exhibition that's on right now at the Detroit Institute of Arts, and up in the upper left corner is the book that was recently published and accompanies that exhibition called Detroit Revealed. And it has photographs by uh, probably about eight different artists, some of them Detroit-based artists like <coughs> Scott Hawking, others like Andrew Moore, and others who see the city from outside and, and see different perspectives on the city. Um, I want to show you just a couple of Scott Hawking's photos because they contrast, I think, kind of significantly with what I just showed you of Andrew Moore's. Uh, this building with the people standing on top is actually the building we just looked at. It's the Michigan Central Station, but from a very different perspective. And not only perspective being on the roof, looking down, looking out over southwest Detroit toward the Ambassador Bridge, but a perspective of engagement with the city, uh, rather than these large-scale um, uh, situations of abandonment. Scott, Scott Hawking looks at those situations of abandonment, but shows us in them something of the presence, the human presence, the 
growth in the city. And I think you can, I, I, I kind of living growth, I'm thinking of it as, as the organic things that come up between the cracks on sidewalks uh, just as art comes up uh, in the city. So that people standing and photographing on top of the Michigan Central Station, <coughs> the graffiti that has already been added there, give a sense of the liveliness. This is, this is an abandoned building, it is. I mean, Andrew Moore is correct. But it is not an empty building. It's a building that has in it a life, uh, a growing life, just like Detroit itself has. So the complexity of the city is, is reflected in this exhibition that, you know, if you haven't seen it, go across the street and have a look. This is another of Scott Hawking's images of the city of Detroit. It's inside of the Fisher Body Plant. But notice that he's built in there what he calls a ziggurat. It's made of the creosote-soaked so uh, uh, wood bricks, or wood, wood uh, blocks, uh, about 6,000 wood blocks from the floor of this company. He's built this old plant. He's built this pyramid into this iconic, static, permanent shape. Uh, that he's put together, you know, it is the most orderly of forms, a pyramid, it is the most stable of forms, and here it is in something that is totally unstable, the, the ruins of an old uh, car manufacturing plant. But they, I think capturing very, in a very nuanced way, the combination of the, of the ruin and abandonment and of the rebuilding, uh, or a search for, for rebuilding. Uh, looking at the city, uh, both in its abandoned state and, and in its possibility, I think is a time to kind of evoke the motto of Detroit, the motto uh, uh, coined by Father Gabriel Richard in 1805, right after the, the city burned, uh, burned down. Uh, his, he, he's uh, often quoted and is quoted in the, the motto of the city of Detroit, Speramus Meliora Resurgit Cineribus. Um, we hope for better things, it will arise from the ashes. Uh, so, how does it arise from the ashes? And what does this have to do with talk, talk that is built as being about arts and the revitalization of the city? Well, one of the things that's often looked, that is often looked to in situations of, of rebuilding is, well, what are, what are the strengths in our city? What are the things that attract people here, that give us pride? And we often look to cultural institutions, flagship, flagship institutions. And I'm showing you four of them here. Two from the 20s, the Detroit Institute, built in the 20s, Detroit Institute of Art and the Detroit Symphony Hall uh, in the Midtown area, and then two new, relatively new additions to the Midtown area, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit in the lower left, and the Sugar Hill Art District, or the uh, George and Nabi Gallery, which is part of the Sugar Hill Art District. Well, here you can see it looking pretty much like an old collision shop, which is what it was. Um, but we're looking at cultural organizations in Midtown Detroit. And Midtown has become a bit of a focus in the rebuilding of the city. Um, and it's a, a, a focus for not only uh, actual physical spaces, but events. Um, and I just kind of bring to mind Art X, the Kresge Foundation funded uh, program last year, which featured the first 48 artists uh, who were recipients of Kresge Fellow Awards, uh, artists in all media, uh, performance arts, literary arts, uh, visual arts, and uh, over a period of several days last spring, Art X uh, gave, uh, gave voice to all of those artists in a lot of different events, and it was a very exciting time in Midtown Detroit for a few days. Um, the former University Cultural Center Association, which is now called Midtown Association, includes a lot of kind of flagship institutions and events, and I've just kind of given you a list here of some of the um, uh, aspects and some of the, the organizations that are featured in the, in the Midtown area. By the way, uh, none of this is intended as being all-inclusive. I'm trying to give you some examples to kind of build a, a way of thinking. Uh, so if your favorite institution isn't on the list, my apologies, uh, but, but this is just to kind of give an idea of a concentration of energy, a concentration of cultural energy in the Midtown area. Uh, we often think of, and it's been mentioned in some of the other presentations already today, of the economic impact. We kind of measure things by bottom line dollars very often. And well, you know, what does that really contribute in terms of money uh, to the city? So there are defenses made sometimes for arts institutions on the basis of how many jobs they provide or how much money they bring in. Um, 
and how effective are they as a stimulus to attract economic development? Uh, this is a, not a bad argument for the arts, but to me it misses a little bit the main point. It's a kind of an instrumental argument. The arts are important because they do this, because they contribute in this or that way to this bottom line. Uh, not to malign that, uh, but just to say, well, let's keep an open mind. Maybe the arts do more than that. Maybe there is something more operating than that. Um, with the attention to the Midtown area, uh, there have been a lot of positive aspects uh, in the experience of Detroit, a lot of businesses. Uh, Compuware has come into the city. General Motors didn't move out of the city. Businesses move and stay in the city. Uh, there have been numerous government foundation and private funding initiatives. Uh, Tech Town itself, uh, in a period of, what, six years, went from a large empty building with one business in it to uh, a building now fully occupied with 250 uh, tenants and a waiting list and an effort to build toward uh, another building. So there are a lot of startup buildings. The three anchor uh, employers in the Midtown area Henry Ford Hospital, Detroit Medical Center, and Wayne State University have all offered um, housing incentives, um, contributions toward either the purchase of uh, a residence or um, rental uh, to encourage their employees and others to move into the Midtown area. And that has brought an influx of young, educated people into the city. Even as the city continues to lose population, even as over the last 10 years, Detroit lost a quarter of its population. At the same time, people are leaving, people are coming in. People are coming in in a particular demographic and they tend to be uh, very often uh, young professional people coming in because of the incentives uh, listed above. And the quality of life improves in this Midtown area. Um, so let's, let's give it to art that it enlivens us and our environment. Um, I'm not including the economic impact, uh, though that, that's there too, but I'd like to think about what are the intrinsic values of art? You know, why, why does it bring people in? Why, you know, what, what is it in art as opposed to, um, well, let's see, there are other, there are other uh, agencies with economic impact. So do baseball games bring people into the city, or so in a water park. It's concentrations of people that have that economic <coughs> impact. I want to argue that art, art changes us. It enlivens us and, and enlivens our environment. So we'll keep, keep that aside. We'll come back to that. But as we talk about these um, improvements uh, in the city, and particularly the concentration of improvements in the Midtown area, I want to just remind us, and we really need to be reminded of this, that there are inequalities and disparities that are actually widening in Detroit. And they fall into a number of areas. Again, this is not an uh, all-inclusive list. You might have one that you think should be included here. And again, apologies for, for giving the one that seems most important to you. But these are a number of important ones. And these inequalities and disparities are in employment. Um, there are whole neighborhoods in the city where the unemployment rate is 100%. It has been for years. Nobody works. Nobody has been able to work. Um, quite different from the influx of new professional jobs in the, in the Midtown area. And I'll just kind of go on. Disparities in education, housing, transportation, health and human services, personal safety, quality of life. Um, if you go, uh, the Midtown area is looking pretty good to me. I, it, and it looks better all the time. And I still point out these new coffee shops, shops opening. And, and I love them. You know, I, mean, I use them too. But go four or five blocks either way. Uh, go 10 blocks either way. And what you run into is a, a neighborhoods that look like this. There is a huge disparity um, between the central spine, uh, which is getting better and better, and the neighborhoods, which are actually deteriorating <coughs> more. Um, just this past week, I don't know how many of you saw or are following this series that the Detroit Free Press began on Sunday and is running this week. How many of you are following that? OK, a few, a few of you. Uh, what this series talks about, you know, Detroit Free Press has been very good at investigative um, journalism. And what we're talking about here is the rate of murders in the city of Detroit uh, in a period of about eight and a half years from 2003 to now. Um, about uh, about 3,300 murders have taken place in the city of Detroit. 3,300 murders. That's more 
than the U.S. troops killed in 10 years of war in Afghanistan, more than that. To me, both of those figures are really disgraceful, that, that 6,000, more than 6,000 people have been lost senselessly. But that Detroit exceeds a war um, uh, rate uh, with, with its murders. Now look, uh, this, this is this kind of beginning uh, page, uh, on the front page, and, or I guess this is my inside page on Sunday, but it, it's followed online. That, by the way, that uh, website that I'm giving you there, www.freak.com, Living With Murder, is really worth taking a look at, and there is a, uh, about a 40 minute video that deals with the imp personal impact this has had on families and the lives of people. But what I'd like to call your attention to right now is the map itself. Um, on this map, it's a map of the city of Detroit, obviously. Um, and the, you can see where um, Highland Park and um, you know, Tramac are separated out. The white spots right in the middle there are, are those two cities that are incorporated within the city of Detroit. But the rest of the city is the city of Detroit. And the darker blue shows a greater intensity of murders, the lighter blue and the white, um, a lesser intensity of murders. And let me just remind you where we are. We're in that midtown area, folks. We're in that central, uh, to my mind, some, somewhat privileged area of the city. And notice, that's pretty white. I, the, I mean, on the map, there's a, it's an area that has really, uh, there's, it's, it's, there isn't any intensity of blue on that, la on that map. Now, I, you know, I looked at this and I was thinking, gee, you know, isn't, that, isn't that interesting? And doesn't that reflect these disparities and inequalities that I've been talking about? Um, I would imagine a map like this could be drawn on other metrics. Um, Maybe education, maybe poverty, um, maybe health, um, any of those metrics. I would imagine the map would turn out something like this. So the concentration in the central midtown area that would be would reflect one experience and the concentration in the neighborhoods as the city reaches out. And read the city reaches out a long ways, folks. It's 139 square miles. Um, and and I think that this is a very telling um, uh, discrepancy that we ought to keep in mind, um, and it brings again that that motto of the city to, of Detroit. You know, we hope for better things. It will arise from the ashes. But how's it going to arise? You know, what are we going to do if we care about that? What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do as we rebuild this city? And 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 I and I, and I congratulate the, the efforts that are going into rebuilding the city. But what are we going to do to extend that to the? To the wider popula population, how are we going to build, as the Ford Foundation says it wants to do, cities that are just and equal, with uh, 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 equal opportunities for all the citizens? Um, let me show you some examples. Let's go over to the east side and look at Heidelberg Street, and look at look at, look at this. Let's look at Heidelberg Street, the burned out house. Uh, how would you like your children? Uh, going to school every day past a house like this. What do you think the message is they get from their city? How much do you think they feel that their city cares for them? Uh, someone who responded to that is uh, Tyree Guyton, who in this case is using a burned out house as a canvas and making it bright and colorful, making it fun, making something happen in that space. Not unlike Scott Hawking's intervention in the larger um, industrial abandoned uh, spaces. For 26 years now, 25 years, almost 26 years, Tyree Guyton has been working in that neighborhood, the neighborhood he grew up in, in on Heidelberg, uh, on the east side of Detroit, Heidelberg and Mount Elliott. Um, he describes beginning that project by walking out on his porch one day and seeing around him houses like we just looked at, kind of burned down or vacant houses, and said, you know, it was gray, everything was gray. And he said, and so are the people. The people had no light, they had no spirit, they had no spark, they had no bounce. And he said, it's gotta be, we've got to address this. And his way of addressing it was to add color, to add liveliness, to add conversation, uh, to create an environment that gave people a chance to see something differently. Uh, I'm including here a copy of Cranes because there was an article just a couple weeks ago, you might have seen it, saying that the Heidelberg, but done by an outside uh, East Coast uh, third party investigator, 
uh, looking at the benefits of the Heidelberg Project and including among those that the Heidelberg Project con uh, contributes $3.4 million a year uh, to the economy of the city through be because it is such an uh, important destination for the city. So people come and their estimate is that this is, you know, there, there is, people buy gas, they, um, you know, buy meals, they contribute to, you know, various things including the Heidelberg Project. Um, so it's, it's kind of ranking it as, a, as an economic um, motivator as well as a cultural and social one. Though I think predominantly it's a cultural and social one. And that's, that was its initial motivation in Tyree Guyton, the artist who began this speaking to his neighborhood um, and in creating a liveliness in that neighborhood. Um, and he's not the only artist who is doing that. There are uh, young artists coming along. Detroit is getting kind of a lot of sticking power, by the way, for, for young artists. And you read about this all the time. And, and many of these artists are, become, are coming to the city because they see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to make their art really ma make a difference, to use their art not as some uh, protected thing in a, uh, a gallery or museum, but something that really impacts people's lives. One of them, uh, there are gardens all over the city. I, you know, I read different estimates on how many of them there are too, but I'm gonna go with 900. That sounds like it's as reasonable a guess as any. I've, on that, I've read them higher and lower. And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they range from very large, well-tended gardens to very simple gardens like this one in the North End, which is actually part of a small arts project um, called the Love Garden, uh, which has painted tires and little, fences, little uh, painted fences and things. It's part of a neighborhood project by young artist uh, Halima Cassells, who is also the uh, founder and director of the Detroit Mural Factory, which did this mural, which you may recognize, it's just uh, uh, down the street, up the street from here on Cass Avenue, though it goes all around. So it starts on Woodward, goes along, what is it, Amsterdam probably, and then up Cass. This is the Cass Avenue side, and I, I'm showing you this because it uh, reflects the spirit of Detroit, you know, the figure downtown and set it in front of the city county building, the seated figure by uh, Frederick Marshall with a, 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 an extended uh, hand uh, with the new city of Detroit. And that's what she has included here in the hand of that figure, her vision uh, of the new city of Detroit. And you can see uh, uh, yellow uh, wind turbine windmills and uh, a kind of pristine, uh, uh, clean, uh, green uh, city of Detroit. So murals like this, uh, both in um, a deteriorated uh, large buildings and on small walls around the city are beginning to change uh, the city. This is the Woodward Avenue side of, uh, it's the old American Beauty Iron Building. And in the lower left is a plaque that's on the corner of that building uh, acknowledging the uh, contributors the artists who contributed to this, and then the students, these are high school students, who painted these large wood, they're, they're the, the, the wood that was used to cover the windows of the old building, and these were taken off, painted on the floor of the old Burton School, and then reattached, uh, and it was a group of about 30 high school kids who did this under the direction of Halima Cassells and a group of about five or six artists that she had pulled together for that purpose. Um, and something I'd like to emphasize as I mentioned to show you this is not only what this is doing in, in terms of changing the environment and the visual, visual environment in the city, but it's bringing people together in constructive work in the city. And a lot of these projects have exactly that as a motivation. The motivation is to create uh, that kind of activity to involve particularly young people and give them, a, give them something to do and give them a sense of their productive involvement in the, the reshaping of the city. This is another project of the Detroit Mural Factory. It's a boarded up house, actually, up on Kenilworth Street. And it's simply a boarded up house. But those boards have been painted now to show the sort of pink curtains against a kind of blue window. Um, it, you know, it just, it, it adds a, a liveliness and a fun. It's a very simple thing. Uh, but these ideas spread across the street from that house is a fire station. Uh, and the, the uh, firemen, were kind of moved by what, the, what these young people were doing, painting the boarded up windows of the house. So they painted the doors, the deteriorated doors of their fire station, bright red and put in these very well-constructed, geometrically, geometrically constructed windows, cleaned up the front of the fire station, and, and, and here it is. I mean, these ideas kind of spread. And I think there is a kind of radiating uh, effect of the arts 
So that in neighborhoods of abandoned lots and burned out houses, art gives us hope in these troubled times. It spreads, it radiates. Um, just a few more examples. This is uh, probably a lot of you have seen this. This is a, uh, I think it's about a, I don't know, a nine-story building, ten-story building on West Grand Boulevard. If you haven't seen it, just drive up Woodward and look right, and you'll see it. You can't miss it. Um, it's a, a mural painted by Katie Craig uh, and a group of, again, high school kids. Uh, they did it by, yeah, they, a lot of this is done on big scissor lifts, and then they also poured paint from the top of the, of the building. Uh, I've talked with her about that. Uh, oh, let me right uh, and she said, oh, you know, for these kids, it was really scary when they started this. And it was scary on two grounds. Many of them didn't see themselves as artists. And what, would they, what could they contribute uh, by painting, and painting a building the size of this? I mean, what about spot? I think you could paint a building 10, feet, 10 stories high. Uh, but also getting on the scissor lift itself, or even leaning over the edge of the top of the building to pour paint down the side was a bit of a challenge. Um, this project uh, was one supported by a group of foundations, uh, Skillman Foundation primarily, but with support from Kresge and also J.P. Morgan Chase, has funded over a 10-year period that began in 1996, uh, has funded $100 million of arts projects, arts and school improvement projects in the city in the six particular neighborhoods that are listed here in the map of Detroit shows where those neighborhoods are. And they're all neighborhoods that were selected because they're uh, depressed, discouraged in some way and in need of help. And the way it works is that artists are invited to make proposals. This is administered through the College for Creative Studies. They're invited to make pr proposals for up to $40,000 for projects that will involve neighborhoods and, and, and affect and change neighborhoods. Uh, this is one that I just think is kind of interesting. It's a Southwest Detroit uh, neighborhood. It's called the Alley Project. And what uh, has happened here is that neighbors have painted uh, uh, under the kind of encouragement and support of an artist named Eric Howard, have painted the fences and alleys uh, that crisscross through those streets in southwest Detroit so that you see as you go down alleys, all these painted garage doors. People paint their own, people paint others. And there is, and you can see this in the upper left, there is a kind of a platform and performance space on an empty lot that was created by Eric Howard and those that he's working with. And it looks like this kind of disorganized graffiti, uh, this stuff that's uh, you know, kind of right, right, right up here. It's, and those are open boards uh, for anybody in the neighborhood. Kids can come and practice making graffiti. And he brings in graffiti artists to work with them, help them learn how to use those spray cans and get three-dimensional results and so forth. So they have periodic paint-ins down in this alley project. Uh, but there is play, you know, there's kind of this purposeful painting of garage, garage doors on, on these alleys that crisscross these blocks, plus this kind of performance space where art and making of art itself becomes a performance and a learning experience. Um, some are not supported uh, through projects like the CPAP, the uh, uh, what is that, kind of community, the kind of community, uh, community. CPAP, Community Public Art Detroit. That's the uh, program that supported those two programs I just showed you about. But some are just people who in a neighborhood uh, see a need, like Tyree Guyton did, and respond to it. Um, one of the neighbors who has done this on Georgia Street on the east side is Mark Covington. By the way, if you look at that series on murder in the Detroit Free Press, and if you look at the video online, there's a, a couple of long interviews with Mark Covington who um, responds to the, uh, the, the, the murder of a, of a really promising young man from this neighborhood who just happened to be in a, going to a barbershop, wrong place, wrong time, and was, was murdered, was the victim of one of these murders. And Mark Covington wanted to make his neighborhood different. He wanted to do something that would bring that neighborhood together, give it a cohesiveness uh, that it didn't have. And he did it through gardens um, and through creating community spaces. And um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of an improvisational thing. I've walked around different times in that neighborhood and garden. People talk about how the neighborhood, people used to tear that neighborhood apart, and now they're working on it. They're keeping it together. They're taking pride in it. Uh, this is a group of Wayne State students on an alternative spring break. Down there working with some of the kids in the neighborhood to paint a fence on the Georgia Street Gardens. So art creates community. This brings people together. So we've got three things going on here. Um, and it's on those three things 
uh, that we've initiated at Wayne State, something called Arts Corps Detroit, which I'll tell you about kind of briefly. Uh, this began about a year ago. Um, it was kind of inspired by the context that we just talked about and the, and, and the idea of Peace Corps and the idea of AmeriCorps, where individuals with energy and talent are put into, invited to come into situations uh, of need. And what happens usually is that those people are also changed by the experience. Their efforts and talents are directed toward real needs in real places with real people struggling to meet those needs. And um, the outcome is often that they too come home changed, uh, aware in a different way than they were of the resources they have, uh, aware of the power of creativity, aware of the power of community, aware of a wider world and, 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 their, and their role in it. So what we hope through Arts Corps uh, is to create a volunteer effort in the arts around the city. We're not addressing the whole world like the Peace Corps did, and we're not building bridges or teaching people uh, how, how to write. We are, we are basically, though some of those things might happen, uh, but we are, we are uh, concentrating on Detroit and we're concentrating on projects having to do with the arts to enhance individual growth, that's both of the volunteers and those they work with, to enrich the community, uh, and to contribute to the economic and social sustainability of Detroit. I want to emphasize economic and social sustainability. We've got four strategies. The first one is service learning courses that are credit generating courses offered through Wayne State. It's actually how I first became kind of aware of the possibility in this by teaching service learning courses, which are courses, by the way, that more or less follow a model of meeting as an academic course, uh, sharing you know, some common readings, sharing some discussion, meeting regularly in a classroom. But the centerpiece for this course is that students do things in the community. And in the case of the ones I've been working with, they do some arts-related project in the community. Um, and they have a sustained experience of volunteering in the community. I, I have done this now for about four years. And you know, interestingly, one of the most impressive parts of it, that, that for me, one of the most impressive parts of that experience has been the effect that that experience has had on students. About a quarter of the students who have taken these courses are still working where they did their volunteer work during that uh, the semester that they were involved in. I mean, there is a kind of sticking power to this. It's very, reward it's very rewarding to do something fulfilling that is really contributing positively to the world. Um, based on that came the idea, well, you know, if this works in classes for students, why not expand this core? Uh, they could be other students who aren't taking these classes, don't have time in their schedule, maybe took them, but would like to continue to do projects from time to time. Or they could be other people who aren't students at all, but who would like to be involved in this type of activity. So that's the idea of a volunteer core. And we're working, and I have to say, we're still struggling to set up a good infrastructure for this, but we're working on that. Uh, we also have a research component, and I'll just kind of Holly point out that the head of our research component is here, Holly Fien, uh, in the School of Education, because there is very little research that exists on the impact of uh, participatory community-based arts projects, either on the communities that they serve or on the volunteers and organizations that um, foster those. So, um, Wayne State is a research university. It's something we can offer to this whole endeavor, and it's a, an important endeavor. I mean, we're, we're looking to create a model here that might be used by other places, and to do that, we have to be able to substantiate fairly well what the results are of what we're doing. So we have a research component, and we have the ambitions of a public programming component. We haven't done that yet because we don't have the resources, but we will at some point, uh, and, or we'll piggyback with someone else. And the idea here is to bring into Detroit, bring into our community, people who are doing uh, interesting, innovative uh, arts community projects elsewhere in the world. Uh, these could be artists, uh, they could be writers, they could be philosophers, they could be statespersons, um, but people who are thinking and acting creatively uh, in the arts and the intersection between art and community. And the idea of that is to bring in people who will bring into our dialogue here new ideas, fresh ideas from their own experience, so that we're not always talking among ourselves, uh, but they will come in with ideas that will stimulate us and, and help us to see things differently as a new perspective comes in. It's like bringing a, 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 an external crit, crit, uh, cr a critic in to do graduate reviews in the art department. You bring in someone who will bring a fresh new perspective. Um, I also have, I have an ulterior motive here too, I have enough 
enough respect and belief in what's going on in Detroit that I think those people will be, those visitors, will be so impressed by what they see that they will leave as ambassadors so that this will also enlarge the dialogue between Detroit and a, and a larger world. Um, so the kinds of activities we do really vary. I'll just give you a few examples here. After school arts programs, uh, schools <coughs> and uh, programs in shelters uh, or treatment facilities. Uh, we work with various community organizations, cultural organizations, and then we concoct projects on our own. So it's pretty wide, wide open. Just to give you a few examples, here's one of the after school arts projects over in the Capuchin Soup Kitchen on the far east side of Detroit where students have gone over, student volunteers have gone over each uh, the one weekday, the same weekday, every week for a semester or longer for those who are continuing to do it or have worked at a, a particular camp or something. Uh, and establish relationships with kids in one of the one of the more troubled neighborhoods of the uh, of the city, so that they have something to depend on. They develop skills. They develop <laughs> something that they can do and find solace in. There's a great healing in when you're living in in, in, in uh, distressed circumstances. There's a, there's a solace in being able to express yourself quietly and freely um, in some sort of arts program. So. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's part of what we're doing over in the Capuchin Soup Kitchen. This is a, a project of the uh, Children's Hospital of Michigan. The uh, attractive young guy with the blonde mohawk, Matt Lambert, is a student uh, graduating this semester, an honor student, graduating in metal, ceramics, and something else. I want to say psychology. Uh, but he spent a year and a half, actually, working with kids over at Children's Hospital to create, as you see on the right, these ceramic tiles that have now become uh, a ceramic tile mural. It's about five feet by five feet. It's permanently installed in Children's Hospital. And the kids in the hospital, with Matt's help and with other volunteers, made these tiles over a period of about a year and a half. And you know, I just want to point out about Children's Hospital, it's a hospital that has a lot of kids come with chronic problems. So that they come back. They're not just there for a quick tonsillectomy. They come back. And the pride of being able to see something that they participated in and you know, point to that is that tile that they made or that, that mural that they were a part of is something that really changes their experience of, of that hospital and their involvement in that hospital. This is a project over at the Mariner's Inn, which is just down the street on Cass Avenue. Uh, Mariner's Inn is a residential treatment program for men uh, overcoming uh, drug or alcohol abuse. And they have a, a very uh, active uh, arts program at Mariner's Inn. And it's been supported in large part by some of the volunteers from Arts Corps Detroit and these service learning courses. This is a, a program where they're, they've made plaster masks where you put wet plaster on, uh, on the, the, the face of whoever was who's willing to sit there and allow that kind of scary process to happen. You have straws up your nose so you can breathe as the plaster dries. And what they've done is made these masks, face masks, which they, they're here painting, and then they wrote reflections on masks. Um, the idea of using a mask to you know, present ourselves in a certain way to the world, or using a mask <coughs> to protect ourselves from the world. He wrote these beautiful reflections, which along with the masks have been exhibited both in a gallery there at the Mariner's Inn and downtown at Swords into Plowshares. Uh, the Mariner's Inn, also had an interest in uh, improving their own space, improving the kind of physical situation that you come into when you came into Mariner's Inn. I, I've been going there for about three years, and I can remember going in there at first. It looked to me like a police precinct. It was this tiny little place that you walked in, and it was painted. You know the color. You've all seen it, that kind of tan color that gets all kind of scuffed up, and they had <coughs> chairs, plastic chairs, that same tan color, and they were kind of broken. And, and the men there wanted to fix it up, and the group of students worked with them. First, they painted the space, three or four different colors of blue. Then they installed a mural that the, the men had actually made with another group of volunteers before, under the direction of the director of the Children's Hospital Art Program, Grace Sarah. Uh, and the, the uh, mural, which you see, a mosaic mural, was installed in this space. But they went on to, oh, this is the space now. It looks a lot different from what I'm describing. It doesn't look like a police precinct anymore, does it? It's a much more inviting space. And they also built another mural under the window where you'd come in and um, go for the kind of reception and 
referral to wherever you're going. The image there is a tree of life, and there are in these blue squares remembrances of men who have gone through the program uh, who didn't make it. And it's, it's remembering that and remembering growing from the roots uh, that, that all the men going through the program uh, go through and remembering those uh, who have been a part of the, of the history and the story at Mariner's Inn. We've, uh, the, one of the first projects we did was actually a huge, huge sculpture, 14 foot sculpture called Invisible Doors. You may know it, and if you don't, take a look next time you go to the Welcome Center, the Wayne State Welcome Center. It's right next door on um, Warren, right near Woodward. It's a, a sculpture that was made by Tyree Guyton, who is standing in the middle here, uh, in the middle of various volunteers that worked with him. Wayne State students and high school students uh, who worked to create that sculpture, which was then later bought uh, and permanently installed by Wayne State. And we've worked out at the Heidelberg Project. Here's Lisa Rodriguez, a uh, volunteer of about three years ago, who is still out at the Heidelberg Project. She's graduating, just graduated in sculpture from Wayne State and constructed that also as about a 14 foot sculpture on the grounds of the Heidelberg Project. Uh, she's gone on to create a huge sundial uh, as wide in diameter as these two tables and a, a reflection garden and continues her work over at the Heidelberg Project. And one of our more recent projects was a Brixel project. This is, you may recognize it, the Detroit Hostel uh, over in North Corktown. Uh, what it looked like at the beginning of the summer is in the upper right, and what it looked like mostly through the project, I don't have an actual, I don't have a photograph of it completely, uh, Brixel project, but Br the Brixel project includes, it involves the idea of thinking about bricks as pixels and painting each brick as you might color a, a pixel to make a design, uh, and this is on the side of the building. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quickly, this is another kind of a one, uh, an event-oriented uh, project. We worked with the Dominican Literacy Center to make on Belle Isle one day last summer flags uh, that were hung in the Eastern Market to uh, bring attention to literacy, the issue of literacy in Detroit and the services that are available. You know, in this city where we are attracting increasingly uh, highly educated, um, you know, talented young people, we still have a 50% illiteracy rate among adults. So this is to call attention to that project and also to call attention to uh, services that are available to address it. I'm going to go kind of quickly. Uh, the Hope District on the east side is another area we've worked. This is a project not unlike Georgia Street Garden, but maybe a bit more evolved, where there are hand-painted signs. One of them is a kind of honeycomb sign. You can see it back here, where people are invited to write their hopes and, and dreams. Uh, and it's a way of kind of capturing those hopes and dreams. Uh, we worked with them on a, a performance project that was uh, done a couple weeks ago. And I want to kind of emphasize that these are people who are not used to volunteers coming in and sustaining their, uh, there's, a, there's a real importance in this kind of sustained commitment. And we had a wonderful volunteer who came with experience with Universal Studios, so she's very uh, experienced in the entertainment industry, and helped this group develop a play in the summer and a musical review. And these people who had been somewhat reticent, didn't necessarily look you straight in the eye, were belting up those songs in their performance a couple of weeks ago. So it's a, a, a project that we will continue to work with. Uh, we're building at the same time a signature project called Lots of Art. You know, Detroit has uh, many, many abandoned lots, burned out houses, abandoned lots. What if we were to shift that around and think about those empty lots, abandoned spaces, um, as canvases for art, and to put in different places, different types of art, and think not about the abandoned lots, but lots of art. And it's a very scalable project. If we do one, we have done one, we have a lot of art. If we do two or more, we have lots of art in here. <laughs> Uh, the first one we did was uh, over in the Hope District. They had already had some kind of creative responses to the deterioration of their neighborhood. And they set out a lot for us. They heard about this project, and this is the welcome sign. They gave us the address and said, can you help us with this, this lot? That was the beginning of the last summer. And what we did over there was um, develop a project. Oh, I'm going to skip over a couple of these. Uh, well, I'll tell you, because skipping over is kind of a crazy thing to do. When you're looking at the slides. 
Um, the idea of lots of, uh, lots of Art is to provide volunteers and resources <coughs> to areas, to neighborhoods that are already doing some work or have some interest in doing some work, and to create signature projects, projects that really reflect what that neighborhood wants, but to put on each project some sort of marker that connects it with Arts Corps so that we begin to have a web of projects around the city. They're not just freestanding, although they are freestanding, but they are also part of a larger web. One of the ideas we have is maybe we make a billboard or something on each lot that would reflect in its imagery the interests of the lot, but have some kind of standard thing that would connect it with lots of art and acknowledge publicly the, all the names of all the volunteers and community artists who worked on it, put the Arts Corps logo on it, and supporters if some organization um, were to provide uh, resources for the project. So these are just kind of examples. But what we did do was build over there a uh, stage that went along with their first performance. Uh, this is the stage we built. This is the for rent sign. It's kind of an entrepreneurial <laughs> effort that they're they're using that uh, stage for, and hope to build kind of a backdrop and a ramp for that stage next summer. But it's already been used by the Hope Players, and we'll continue to work with them. So what we're doing is through this Lots of Art project is hoping to identify lots that would be available, initiate on those lots collaborative efforts, and bring uh, volunteers and neighborhood groups together uh, in a mutual effort to improve and heal our, our community. So Arts Corps is going to increase its involvement in Detroit, expand the work in neighborhoods, seek artists and collaborators, um, and we're looking for volunteers with all skill sets, uh, we're looking for financial support, always, and we're always looking for interested friends. Um, we're building what we have, and this is from that Hope District sign with the honeycomb, and it's the reflection of a kid. Hope is all I have. Sometimes that all it takes. So in conclusion, let's go back to things we kind of picked up through there. Art enlivens our us and our environment, gives hope in troubled times, it creates community. Art is not extra. Art is part of life. <laughs>
um, you know, perpetuated there, uh, that the people who have the kind of inclination to kind of find a new route, I'd like to say should be encouraged in that. Uh, but it, it really calls for some pretty realistic conversation because you know the world is what it is, and we have we have to assess it, and, and the individual who will be making those decisions has to assess it. But you know, I'm I'm kind of for encouraging people to follow their heart. Uh, you know, I have a lot of confidence that that works. That you know, if, if people really devote themselves, if they're really dedicated, and you know, that's maybe sometimes what you think of as artists have. They have the they have the dedication to do whatever it is to stay with it, to stay with it, to stay with it. And if they're really driven by a passion, uh, somehow, if we find each other, those of us who you know, kind of have that passion, we will find a way to make this work. I, I mean, that's not at all a very satisfactory answer, but I mean, I, I kind of, I, you know, I, I think what you're talking about is talking with somebody who has to make a personal decision in their life. Um, do I take this kind of risk? This is what I love or think I love, or do I go a, a, a safe path? And uh, my answer to that is usually that you don't know what the safe path is. So how you make, you have to decide how you're gonna make decisions, but mine would be at least give a shot to what you really have a passion for. I, I, I welcome a response because I don't have a good answer to that. There's a question in yeah. there. You have an answer for that? Yeah. I do have an answer good. for that. Uh, recently I had the opportunity Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, but I had the opportunity to build a sensory garden alongside the PD Trade Bureau. Oh, Grand Boulevard, one of those. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, through that, it was, uh, it, it's reached out to so many people in the community. And the um, biggest impact it was the community in the AmeriCorps volunteers that came out with that army. And it's, it's been just so enriching. I, it's hard to even explain or it's hard for you to all fathom how much that has had an impact on the community. Revitalization, people, it's, it's a very visible space. But the feedback from the, from the people who volunteer have come back to me and say, I am so delighted that I can help. Because I bring my family and friends back here, and I tell them, I was part of this. Yeah. I made this happen. And I, while this was, I designed it, but I was also allowing them to have input. And we had some tough lines, though. We had some very big, big elements were in there. They on their own decided to make an edge on the pathway. And normally in our class, I would have said, you know, stop us now, which is part of the design. But I let go with it. And that it just, it's, it's very dramatic. And it, it just meant so much more. For them to have input be part of that. Thanks, thanks so much for that comment. Congratulations. We had another comment or question. Well, I was going to mention that I attended the Reimagining Work, a gathering hosted by Gracie Boggs. And it was very powerful, and I planned for 2012 summer, August, to have a kind of like a further concrete concretizing of the ideas that were manifested there. It was national, international, it was interviewing in Chicago, Detroit. I think we have this compulsive moment with, um, with, with, with the Occupy Everywhere, with the University Boggs and the Reimagining Work, with uh, the Urban Gardens, with the Aquaponics in Chicago, where that was, they put Aquaponics in an abandoned building and that led to smaller models that were in grade schools so kids could learn about the, the ecosystems and the life cycles. and. And then, it, and then he was offered a position at the University of Aquaponics and was bridging with Detroit. So I, mean, I think it's a very convulsive moment of, of things birthing and things dying. And I think that interweaving is what you do, which is what we all do to create that stronger fabric. And I think that's the healing. So it's how we take care of one another. It's time to grow our own souls. See how Dave Chardin said it earlier. It's we have to have a quantum leap of our soul. Gracie Boggs says it. Um, and, and that's what's happening. And that's what is our calling. And so, that. So I was going to ask about service learning because before is that is that we do we get how do we do that as faculty to get I'm interested in that I've taught service learning class before um, my classes have been crosses with the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies and with us all in this audience you know give support to that hope that that stays open and do whatever we can for that to keep that open and be a voice for that standing collectively 
And uh, so I think there's this moment, it's like the tipping point of our collective souls as we try to grow our own and then as we enter with each other, that we're on a precipice of something very profound. And with that, you know, I, I'd like to acknowledge Maine, who has exemplified that soul. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gerald. <Meryl. laughs> that we've been, you know, kind of turning to people that we've worked with and organizations that we've worked with. But uh, 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 at the College for Creative Studies, which is administering the CPAP, pro uh, CPAP program, they have a, an application process, an online application process. You apply online to, to join the roster of artists, and they have a, uh, so, so criteria by which they choose their roster of artists. And then artists who are on there, and this, this is all online, you can see who has been selected for that, you can see how you, you know, get out of that list. And, um, and then those artists, um, any of those artists, once they're selected, have the option of uh, suggesting proposals, and um, they have a board that considers the, the proposals. So they have a very systematic way of doing it. Uh, in Arts Corps, we don't have quite such a systematic way yet. We don't, we don't really have a systematic way, but what I'm kind of thinking may make sense is to work through Data Driven Detroit, which is a, um, an organization uh, that looks at the city and the, um, the neighborhoods and the needs of neighborhoods and knows where there are empty lots. And to work, my, my sense is to maybe work the other way around, to, find, to identify uh, neighborhood, neighborhoods in need and with an interest in working on this, and then put out a call uh, to art, an open call to artists uh, for uh, proposals for working on that lot, uh, you know, on, on, on particular lots. But that's that's kind of partial answer because this is a this is very much a work in progress, and I and I appreciate what you're saying, and I appreciate the work you've done. Congratulations on that, and appreciate what you're saying about the complexity. This is not so easy. It takes a an infrastructure and some very careful organization to to pull it off. Um, the, I think one of the keys is to have a very open conversation with the community group where this is going so that it, it is, we don't, I don't have any interest in doing a plop down sculpture someplace that a community group doesn't want, but to have whatever it is, whether it's playground equipment or a painted mural or a garden or um, uh, exercise equipment uh, or you know, anything that is, is speaking somehow to a need in the neighborhood, uh, to do that in combination, with, help them accomplish what they're after. I think the dialogue is part of it. But the organizational structure is, is still something we're working on. Thanks for your comment, though. I you know, appreciate what you've done. I think we have time for one more question. Just a quick question. Um, I'm not an artist, but I like art. Is there anything? <laughs> no, but is there anything? And I guess this is, kind of speaks to the first session earlier today. Is there any sort of website or does Arts Core Detroit have anything listed on its website to tell people if where to go so they can look at it or even like um, if they wanted to do like a walking tour or something like that in the city. It, it's almost like unless you're in the industry, you have no idea where anything is. Yeah, so that's, that's a, it's a really good point you're making. I think it's one of the challenges, in a way kind of a problem to have there are a lot of kind of isolated but very exciting things happening in the city. We do have a website and we've got a, a brochure, so pick pick one up if you don't have I one. Do, I do have it. It's, 
there's a website there. It, it isn't as full as what you're describing. What I'm, what I'm hoping as we get into this, uh, lots of art, is that we will have a, a, a map. I'd like to see it at some point even be an interactive map so that you could see where these places are around the city. And you could make comments. There could become a dialogue around, around these. So we're looking right now for some funding uh, to you know, move in that direction. So what you're saying is very much in resonance with what we're thinking, but we're not quite there yet. But take a look at the website. You know, we're, we're making progress, and, and we're getting there. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you.